evening. So Chris has been talking about the telescope itself and the science. John has been talking about the instrument that receives the light. And I'm going to be talking about something which is in between, which is called adaptive optics. And adaptive optics, as I will show you, is something, a, a kind of instrument that process, processes the light, cleans it, so that the, the instrument can actually take advantage of the full resolution, the optical resolution of the telescope. So Australia, in the past years, uh, I've, I've been, uh, we've been uh, developing expertise in adaptive optics, and that's uh, actually one of the areas where we think we can contribute uh, in a major way to the GMT, as I will show. So what is adaptive optics person? What does it do? Well, Chris, Chris told us that when you build larger telescope, of course, it's to answer you know, fundamental um, uh, question about science. But how does it do that? Well, you build larger telescope because it's going to collect more light. That's, that's an obvious point. But something you have to know also is that when you build larger optics, the amount of detail that you can see in your object also grows. And it grows inversely, uh, linearly with, your, uh, with your, the, the diameter of the telescope. <coughs> Meaning that if your telescope diameter increases by a factor of two, the amount of detail you're going to be able to see in the image is four times uh, the, the amount of detail you were, you were seeing with the initial telescope. So that's illustrated by this slide here, where this is here an image uh, that you would see with the, the VLT, which is a ground-based telescope, ground telescope. This is an image that can be seen, actually, uh, nowadays by the HST, the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a diameter of 2.5 meter. So now, if you go to this eight meter uh, telescope on the ground and you apply adaptive optics and you just forget that there is atmospheric turbulence, then uh, you can see mo many more details. You can see deeper, you can see that the exposure see now is going down to from uh, 1,600 seconds to 160 seconds, but you can see also more details. If you go to this extremely large telescope, and that's what it will provide, it will provide, you know, many, many more details. You can see many, many, many more details, and, and it's the same as saying that your angular resolution is actually increasing quite significantly. And on top of that, of course, because you have a, a larger collecting area, your exposure time decreases quite significantly. So that really demonstrates, you know, the power of having larger and larger telescope. However, what's bad when you have a ground-based telescope, meaning a telescope which is built uh, at sea level or on, on the ground, I mean, not in space, is that you, you are going through the light coming from astronomical object is going through the atmosphere. And atmosphere is bad for astronomical imaging because what, the, what atmosphere does essentially, if you look at this star here with a large telescope and you blow it up, you know, many, many times, you're, you're kind of zooming on this star, what you see is that. And that's the effect of atmospheric turbulence. So it's the same as if, you know, in summer, you are looking uh, at a, dis a distant object across a desert or across, you know, a parking lot, you will see it moving. The image is moving. Well, it's exactly the same when you're looking at stars. And uh, so, in effect, what it does is that the image that you had before uh, with this uh, atmospheric turbulence is now transformed into that, which is a blurry image. And in fact, the fact is atmospheric turbulence blurs the image, so taken from the ground, and it, 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 does, it does so uh, so that the angular resolution of a 25 meter, for instance, the GMT, is actually not better than the resolution that you would get with a 20 centimeter telescope. So of course you have many more photons, but if you don't do anything about it, you don't have a better angular resolution, which means that you won't see more details. So to solve that situation, you can do two things. You can go in space, where you don't have any turbulence, you don't have any atmosphere, but it costs a lot of money. I mean, typically, you know, space mission, they are extremely good, but they cost about 100 times more than an equivalent telescope, diameter, telescope on the ground. Or you can try to correct for this atmospheric turbulence that has induced this blurring of the, uh, of the images. So that's what I'm saying here, and I'm going to demonstrate you know, how we do it. But adaptive optics can fix this and restore the ultimate uh, resolution of your telescope. OK, so how does it do it? Well, essentially, it does it with two main optical elements, two main elements, I would say. One is uh, what we call a wavefront sensor, which is, in fact, you could call it a light wave sensor. So what it does is that it looks at the star and analyzes 
the deformation of the light wave that has been induced by atmospheric turbulence. And then this information is processed by a computer and sent to deform a deformable mirror that wobbles and counteracts, in fact, the effect of the atmospheric turbulence. So that when the light, you know, the distorted light bounces off this deformable mirror, it's straight again, and therefore allows you to reach the ultimate resolution of your telescope. So that's a technique that's been around for about 25 to 30 years that were first developed uh, by the military in the US and then applied to astronomy about 22 years ago. And uh, recently it's been also applied to medical imaging and other type of, uh, of science uh, applications. All right, so it exists, it's been around, as I said, for 22 years. It's installed in most of the eight meter, or even all of the eight meter telescope in the world, but a couple. And uh, that's actually, you know, real result that you can, you can that they, they have gotten in, uh, for instance, the Gemini 8-meter telescope. So this is what you get looking at this uh, uh, globular cluster uh, when you don't use adaptive optics. And if you use adaptive optics, that's what you get. So it demonstrates, you know, very, very clearly that uh, with, uh, with adaptive optics, you see first more details, many, many more details, but you can see also deeper because, okay, so here you see all, all of these deep, deep star, uh, very faint star, uh, you, don't, you don't see them, whereas it reveals the faint star here with adaptive optics. Another very nice example is, for instance, by a Keck Observatory that uh, Chris was uh, mentioning earlier. This is uh, a new image of Uranus without and with adaptive optics. So you see the really striking difference. Um, so one thing which I like to show, uh, because it's very nice, is that uh, this is related to laser gaze star. And uh, I'm sure that if you have read about adaptive optics, you have heard about laser. It's something that you might see within the next couple of years atop Stromlo, because we are developing also a system with laser gaze stars for different applications. Uh, but uh, it's something which is related to the need of a reference source. As I, as I was saying, you have a light wave sensor. So to have a sensor, you have to have a signal. And the signal is provided by a nearby guide star, or star, just a star. But sometimes, you're looking at a, a, a fraction of the sky in a direction where there is no bright star. And then, well, before laser guide star, you couldn't do anything. You just go to somewhere else. Well, now there is what we call laser guide star, is that when, if you don't have a star, you can create your own star to be your reference signal. And you do that by actually shining a laser, which is uh, at the sodium wavelength, is the same orange wavelength that you have uh, in public lights. And you actually uh, excite sodium atoms that are 90 kilometers above ground, and they fluoresce, they shine, and you can see you can collect some of the light, and it serves as a guide star. So it's extremely nice when you go now in many, many sites, you can see guide stars. Uh, this is a, a picture, a long, long exposure picture taken at Gemini. And I have also a movie which shows, uh, that's actually, uh, it's been taken at Mauna Kea, which is uh, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, one of the Gemini telescopes is there, into which Australia uh, has a partnership. And you, you can see that, for instance, those are the two keg. Uh, they are pointing toward the galactic center there, and they were using laser guy star. Um, another big success, actually, was the discovery uh, of uh, the black hole and uh, Oops, okay. So it's actually quite impressive because at the top of Mauna Kea, you have now four telescopes having laser. And sometimes you see the four lasers shine uh, at the same, uh, during the same night. So it's quite, quite impressive. The, the, the bad thing about laser is that other people know where you are pointing. So you cannot hide it anymore. <laughs> All right, so uh, this, this image is dear to my heart because it's an instrument, uh, first of its kind, uh, was PI for that, at Gemini. Uh, actually, AO adaptive optics was the first concept, but now it has diversified into different breeds. So you have the, the adaptive optics, for instance, for moderate resolution gain, but very wide field. You have other adaptive optics to study planets that are very, very small field, but you go uh, toward a very, very high optic uh, image quality. And that's an example. It's actually one of the most, I think, uh, exciting application of adaptive optics because now uh, for instance, this is uh, the brown dwarf uh, GL299, um, as it was discovered by Paloma, then imaged by HST. And this is now what you can do from the ground with 8-meter telescopes. You see how, how far, uh, how superior this is compared to even space, just because of the nice control 
of, uh, of the light and how it's scattered. And finally, um, so as I said, there is a strong expertise in LFT optics in Australia. Uh, there is three instruments plus a laser gas star facility that are uh, envisaged for, for GMT. And we, I hope that we will play a major role in two of these, the laser tomography, adaptive optics, and laser gas star facility. And finally, uh, okay, so that's a simulation, uh, a simulation, this one is not a real image of what we should achieve, achieve with the GMT with adaptive optics, without, sorry, and with adaptive optics. And finally, my last graph is to say that uh, uh, aside this GMT activity, we are also um, applying uh, this knowledge to other things, like for instance, we are participant at the ANU to the uh, Cooperative Research Center for Space Environment Management, where we are applying adaptive optics techniques to track and eventually maybe deorbit some of the space debris. So that's a very interesting application. Thank you.